the 2010s are behind us and we got a ton of great new rides over the last decade. Today, I don't want to just look at the best coasters that debuted between 2010 and 2019. I want to look at the most important coasters. These are the coasters that started a trend, or raised the bar for a certain record that it broke, or signaled that a park or a manufacturer was on the upswing. This isn't just about greatness, it's about moving the industry forward. These are the most important coasters that opened in the 2010s. Number 10. Before I dive into the list, I wanted to look at coasters that were of particular significance to their park, but not the industry as a whole. Let's start from the beginning. 2010. Cedar Fair made their first large-scale investment into Carowinds with Intimidator. This was the start of a golden age for Carowinds, as they've since added Fury 325 and Copperhead Strike, as Cedar Fair has clearly paid Carowinds as one of their preferred parks to build into a major destination. In 2012, SeaWorld ordered a mock multi-launch coaster for their park in San Diego, Manta. While the other two SeaWorld parks already had major coasters, San Diego had always been shut out since receiving the Journey to Atlantis water coaster eight years prior. There are pretty stringent restrictions on what SeaWorld San Diego can build so close to the coastline, and it seemed to be holding the park back in the thrill ride department. But Manta broke the ice as their first non-water coaster, and since then, SeaWorld has been working to add whatever they legally can to this park a Skyrocket 2, a piece of crap Skyline, a B&M dive coaster, and possibly another launch coaster for 2021. In 2013, Cedar Fair finally threw a bone to one of their newest parks that they'd been neglecting since acquiring it in 2006, California's Great America. This park hadn't gotten a new coaster since their Wild Mouse in 2001, and a dozen years later, seven years into Cedar Fair's reign, they finally invested a major GCI wooden coaster into the park, Gold Striker. This addition came as the San Francisco 49ers were building their new stadium next door, so maybe Cedar Fair decided that this park would suddenly have a higher profile and it deserved more attention. Since Gold Striker's addition in 2013, Cedar Fair has renovated their stand-up coaster into a floorless, given them an RMC Raptor, and it looks like a B&M Hyper is in their near future. After being neglected for more than a decade, Gold Striker marked the start of a new era for Great America. Farmington, Utah is in the middle of nowhere, a little town north of Salt Lake City and the home of Lagoon, which is not really near any other park. Silverwood to the north, Elitch Gardens to the east, Cliffs Amusement Park to the south, and Vegas to the west. What could this park build to make them a destination? In 2015, they figured it out. Cannibal, an in-house made roller coaster standing over 200 feet with the steepest drop in America at the time at 116 degrees. This ride is ridiculous and immediately found its way on every enthusiast's bucket list. Cannibal put Lagoon on the map. 2015 also brought something unprecedented to two smaller but well-known parks in America, a large-scale steel coaster. Holiday World and Knobles were both known for their wooden coasters, but didn't have anything to offer thrill-seekers in the steel department. 2015 would put an end to that for both parks. Knobles would install the compact Zero Tower Coaster Impulse at the front of the park, and Holiday World would install the launched B&M wing coaster Thunderbird in the back of the park. These extreme steel coasters showed that these two parks were willing to branch out from their norm and we're still waiting to see what their next move will be. We're going to kick off the actual list with a couple coasters that kicked off the Clone Wars. Well, not those Clone Wars. I'm talking about coasters that were so compact and cheap that they would be mass produced throughout the decade. The Italian SBF Visa Group came in with their compact spinning coaster, a figure eight layout that could literally fit anywhere. Funny enough, you won't find these at any of the major park chains but they exploded among smaller parks and other places also, specifically pizza places. It's not actually clear which spinning compact coaster debuted first in 2014, so I'll just give it to Crazy Coaster at Silverwood since I've been on that one and it's the only one from 2014 that I have footage of. It was one of 11 that opened up in that first year and by the end of the decade, there would be 93 operating around the world. These are fun little kiddie coasters and have provided credits where credits could never be found before. The next clonable model that debuted last decade started with Six Flags Fiesta Texas and Batman the Ride. This 2015 edition was cloned seven times over the next four years, all at other Six Flags parks except for Arashi at Nagashima Spa Land. So seven Six Flags parks now have these free spins. They are indeed the Vekoma boomerangs of the 21st century, and we can trace their roots back to Batman the Ride at Fiesta Texas. It was very original at the time of its opening, but thanks to the attack of the clones, no, not that Attack of the Clones. I'm talking about the mass influx of free spins into Six Flags parks. 
Now it's seen as just another stinking clone. Number 15 maybe belongs with my opening screed about coasters being important to just their own park, but this one is a little different for a couple reasons. It's Lightning Run at Kentucky Kingdom in 2014. Kentucky Kingdom had been standing but not operating since 2010 when Six Flags shut the park down after the 2009 season. They had been unable to negotiate a lease agreement with the Kentucky State Fair Board since the park sits within the Kentucky Exposition Center, which makes for a very weird setup. Ed Hart saved this park and reopened it four years after its closure and did it with a bang. Lightning Run is a Chance Rides Hyper GTX that came with a $7 million price tag and is praised by coaster enthusiasts for being an airtime machine. This should have been the start of the Chance Hyper GTX revolution, but that hasn't caught on. And by that, I mean not a single other one has been built, but it's bound to happen at some point. Regardless, Lightning Run announced Kentucky Kingdom's return with authority, and the park has only gotten better in the five years since, with Storm Chaser and then Kentucky Flyer. Number 14 represents something that the coaster world hadn't seen in over 100 years, a wooden shuttle coaster. This is Switchback at ZDT's Amusement Park, opening in 2015. ZDT's is a tiny little family fun style park that wanted a large scale wooden coaster. Completing a full circuit given the land they had to work with would be next to impossible. Lucky for the park, the Gravity Group was up for the challenge making a name for themselves by doing things with wooden coasters that has never been seen before. The first modern wooden shuttle coaster would feature a switch track and a vertical spike, which means that not only did it not have to complete a full circuit, it would add the thrill of going forward and backwards. Gravity Group and ZDTs was a match made in heaven, and this opened the door for other tiny parks to consider adding a low-cost, thrilling coaster which seemed impossible before Switchback. Number 13 is a coaster that represented an end of an era and the beginning of another. This is Raptor at Gardaland. For the beginning of the prior decade, the Floorless Coaster was the go-to looping B&M model that most parks were after. But the last one in the US was installed at Dorney Park in 2005. Only two more would pop up worldwide, that being in China for the 2011 season and India for the 2013 season. The Floorless died out and B&M came up with a brand new concept that would sell 13 coasters in the 2010s. This is the Wing Coaster. These have been especially popular overseas, but four were installed in America between 2012 and 2015. These continue to be popular, with three more slated to open overseas in the next two years, and one is rumored to be coming to King's Dominion next year also. Raptor at Gardaland was the pioneer of this group, the only one to open in the 2011 season. Number 12 shattered a record and it did it in spectacular fashion, 121 degrees. This is the angle of descent that Gerslauer put on Fuji Q Highlands Takabisha for the 2011 season. This is only about 9 to 10 degrees steeper than the existing SNS L Loco models, Steel Hog, and Mumbo Jumbo. But those drops are pretty small, and you aren't at that angle for very long. This added an extra 10 degrees and basically doubled the size of the drop. Gerschlauer and Fuji Q Highland raised the game for these beyond vertical drop coasters and paved the way for Cannibal at Lagoon in 2015 and TMNT Shellraiser at Nickelodeon Universe for 2019. Number 11 broke a record in America that inexplicably stood for 31 years. In 1988, Shockwave opened at Six Flags Great America with seven inversions. Seven would be the standard number for Aerodynamics and B&M for their large-scale loopers. In North America, nobody dared go beyond that point. Even as B&M opened Dragon Con in Spain with eight inversions in 1995, and Intamin started opening eight and ten inversion coasters in Europe and Asia shortly after. In 2019, SNS and Kennywood finally broke through that seven inversion barrier for the US when they opened Steel Curtain with nine inversions. I don't know why the 8 to 10 inversion model was never brought to the US, but maybe now with Steel Curtain, we'll see more inversion based coasters that will hit double digits. Number 10 broke, no, shattered, a worldwide record. Alton Towers in the UK can't build above the tree line due to local ordinances, but they have the desire to add the best thrill rides, so they need to get creative. In 2013, they chose to do this by demolishing the inversion record. The Intamin 10 inversion model was already in several parks in Europe and Asia, but in order to make a huge splash, Alton Towers and Gerslauer installed a 14 inversion coaster known as the Smiler. If anyone tries to break this record, they have their work cut out for them. The Smiler raised this bar to a level that may not be reachable for a long time. Number 9 stretched the limits of what we thought was possible with a wooden coaster. Rocky Mountain Construction was still a new company with just one coaster under their belt when they were contracted to work with Silver Dollar City to build a ground up wooden coaster for the 2013 season. They had a topper track wooden coaster model that they wanted to make a reality and show off what it was capable of. The coaster was called Outlaw Run and it would not be your typical wooden coaster. We had seen Son of Beast fail as the first inverting wooden coaster and that inversion was made of steel. 
Outlaw Run would feature three inversions on this wooden topper track, including a double barrel roll finale. The Gravity Group was working on a similar project at the same time, adding a corkscrew to Hades at Mount Olympus, and since then has worked an inversion into many of their layouts. The other major wooden coaster manufacturer, GCI, has showcased an inverting dueling model at IAPA that will eventually be added to a park somewhere in the future. I believe this inverting wooden coaster revolution was kicked off with Outlaw Run in 2013 and its three amazing inversions. Number eight also stretched the limits of what we thought was possible, but this time with a spinning coaster, and we're going right back to Silver Dollar City for Time Traveler. Mock Rides debuted their extreme spinning coaster here for the 2018 season, featuring a vertical drop, launches, and inversions. Pretty standard, but when you add in the spinning cars factor, it takes this model to the next level. Spinning coasters to this point had mostly been small family attractions, so this took that concept and combined it with an extreme thrill coaster and made something amazing. So far, Mock Rides is the only one to take on this idea, but this was a pretty recent addition, so we'll see how the other companies react. Mock has another one of these extreme spinners coming to Plopsa Land in 2021, and we'll have a spinning back car on their new coaster coming to Australia's Dream World in 2020. So expect this trend to continue on. Number seven is another coaster that absolutely shattered a major record. We have to go all the way back to the beginning of the decade for Formula Rosa at Abu Dhabi's Ferrari World. King Dakka held the record for the fastest coaster in the world for five years before Intamin broke its own record, topping King Dakka by over 21 miles per hour and reaching a top speed of 149.1 miles per hour. It's so fast that the park requires its riders to wear protective goggles. This has a long drawn out layout, which is a nice change from the short accelerator coasters. It also takes nearly five seconds to reach the top speed, so it's not the most extreme launch ever, but the sheer speed of 149.1 miles per hour should put this on everybody's bucket list, and Formula Rosa definitely raised the bar to a height that will be tough to surpass in the future. Number six is yet another coaster that stretched the limits of what we thought was possible. And frankly, given the issues that it's had, it proves that it was really before its time. This time we're going to Dollywood for Lightning Rod, a 2016 RMC topper track wooden coaster with a launched lift hill. This coaster has had a ton of problems since its opening year with extended periods of downtime, but it seems like maybe they've made the adjustments necessary to keep the ride open for the most part. The growing pains that Lightning Rod has gone through and the progress they've made over the last three years will surely lead to another launch wooden coaster in the future, but there had to be a trailblazer and this was it. For number five, we're going north of the border to Canada's Wonderland for the first B&M Giga Coaster, Leviathan. Before 2012, Giga Coasters were only built by Intamin, with one Morgan out there that seemed to be a one-off. Leviathan proved that B&M was willing to take their hypercoaster model and supersize it, and we got a taste of what a B&M Giga Coaster would look like. This is a lot different than their hypercoaster model, which usually featured repetitive camelbacks to give its riders as much airtime as possible. Leviathan also has airtime hills, but also used those extra 100 feet of height to showcase its speed, with big bank turns and low to the ground elements. Intamin hasn't built a Giga Coaster since Intimidator 305 in 2010, and it's B&M that's taken the reins in the Giga market, following up Leviathan with Fury 325 in 2015 and Orion in 2020. B&M is now the king of the Giga Coaster, and it started with the prototype, Leviathan. Number four can be considered important for many reasons, but there's one reason that I'm thinking of that may not be so obvious. It's widely been considered to be the greatest coaster ever built since its debut in 2018, Steel Vengeance at Cedar Point. It's not on here just because it's great. I don't have Fury on there even though that's great because I can't pinpoint a good reason why it was super important to the industry. But Steel Vengeance holds a special place. Back in 2016 when Mean Street gave its final rides, there was a serious question about the future of that plot of land. An RMC conversion was in no means a given because Cedar Fair had never worked with RMC up to that point. While most of the new coasters coming to Six Flags between 2011 and 2015 were RMC creations. When we saw the RMC truck parked outside the Mean Streak area, it was a huge victory for the amusement industry. They went on to add Twisted Timbers to King's Dominion and Railblazer to California's Great America in the same year. They haven't added a new RMC since 2018, but at least now we know that Cedar Fair is willing to work with RMC and Steel Vengeance was the first proof that this would be the case. Number three is a coaster that opened overseas and I'm not even sure many enthusiasts were all that aware of it, but it was a sneak peek into the future of coasters. This is Formula at Energylandia, a Vacoma space warp. This was the first look into new Vacoma, which had totally rebranded their image since the days of the rough looping coasters of the 90s and early 2000s. They had taken a slow and steady path to redefining their image. And we had a couple sneak peeks along the way, but Formula was really the beginning of what we've been seeing from Vacoma over the last three years and into the future. 
These smooth, steep, loopy, blitz-style coasters that we've seen announced for the 2020 season look to be some of the better coasters in the world. They can be easy to overlook for American enthusiasts since they're mainly in Europe and Asia, but Vekoma is starting to dominate that market with these awesome looking coasters. And it all started with the Space Warp coming to Poland back in 2016. Number two is a new take on an old concept, and it's something that I think can revolutionize the way that coasters will look in the future. We've seen single rail coasters in the past, like the family style steeplechase coasters, or even the single rail suspended coasters, but nothing that could be considered a real thrill ride. This is Wonder Woman Golden Lasso Coaster at Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. The first extreme single rail coaster introduced to the world. Railblazer at California's Great America opened the same year in 2018, but I'm showcasing Wonder Woman as the one that opened first. Single rail coasters are capable of tight maneuvers that regular coasters can't pull off, and this is just the beginning of the single rail movement. RMC has already introduced their bigger and longer Raptor with Jersey Devil Coaster at Six Flags Great Adventure. They also have their T-Rex model in the works that could exceed 500 feet and will feature a larger rail that could seat two across rather than having the riders sit single file like with the Raptors. A 500 foot T-Rex would change the whole landscape of the coaster industry and it's only a matter of time before other manufacturers try their hand with the new possibilities that the single rail model offers. Finally, number one is a no-brainer. The 2010s were defined by the emergence of one manufacturer, Rocky Mountain Construction, and their first project was New Texas Giant at Six Flags Over Texas back in 2011. Six Flags gave RMC their first opportunity to convert an old, rough, unpopular wooden coaster into an elite hybrid. With a relatively cheap price tag, Six Flags took advantage of RMC to rework lots of other aging wooden coasters in the chain, and others soon joined in to get their hands on an RMC creation. RMC added ground-up wooden coasters to Silver Dollar City and Dollywood. They also helped Kentucky Kingdom get back on the map and started working with Cedar Fair in 2016. They showed what they can do with a single rail design and have recently taken their talents overseas. Other manufacturers are beginning to adopt concepts from RMC in their new designs also, including B&M, Intamin, and GCI. Since 2011, RMC has opened 19 coasters with two more set for a 2020 opening and all are considered to be very good to great to elite coasters, depending on who you ask. New Texas Giant kicked off this movement, and if that had not been a great success, who knows what the path of RMC would have looked like over the past nine years. That's a wrap for the most important coasters built in the 2010s. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and if any other coaster that I left out here belongs on this list. Don't forget to leave this video a like, and if you're new here, please consider subscribing for more content like this, and I'll see you guys all next time.